thank you all so much for being here. Everybody online, thank you very much as well. Uh, I, clearly, everybody here, everybody watching wants the same thing, no doubt about it. Uh, we want uh, uh, some of the opportunities that people living in the UK and other rich countries have to be extended to people, to more people living in Africa. Uh, I'm here to argue that there should be more uh, rigorous impact evaluation of our efforts to do exactly that because it will help us help more people. And I'm, I'm going to be very clear about what I mean by impact evaluation, what I mean by rigorous impact evaluation. Uh, I'm going to argue that it is not randomization. I'm going to argue that it is also not optional for our efforts. And I'm going to argue that uh, it is, it can be, and should be an ef uh, effective and ethical tool for aid advocacy. Um, I have been fascinated by impact evaluation for a long time. Uh, ever since uh, many years ago, I lived here, Santa Cecilia, Colombia. Uh, I worked on an agricultural extension project. And uh, that project was the successor to another project called Plosan that had failed. Uh, uh, in the left, uh, upper left-hand corner of the screen, you can glimpse the mostly abandoned headquarters of that project at the time I arrived. And I was fascinated ever since then by how uh, a lot of very smart, qualified, well-intended people could uh, work so hard for uh, very little uh, lasting result. Now, um, what do I mean by impact evaluation? I want to be extremely clear about this. To me, an impact evaluation is a comparison of what happened with the project to that which happened, that which would have happened without the project. And it must always be cost effectively rigorous. Uh, not every project should get an impact evaluation. Obviously, an emergency humanitarian intervention, giving out water to people after the Haiti earthquake, is something that should be done with all deliberate speed and have no impact evaluation. But if we're going to speak about impacts, if we're going to make claims about causes and effects, by definition, there is no alternative to giving some kind of consideration, and I really mean within a very broad range, some kind of consideration to what would have happened had we never arrived with our project and done what we did. And what I mean by rigor is uh, that uh, uh, a pro a, a, an impact evaluation, statements about what a project caused are more rigorous, more persuasive, to the extent that they are uh, made independently, that they serve a consistent goal that is clear and does not change, uh, and that those claims are transparent. And that's all I mean by rigor. Now, I don't believe that there's any such thing as a, rig as a simply rigorous or a simply unrigorous uh, impact evaluation. There always has, has been, is, and always will be a spectrum of rigor in every impact evaluation. And uh, uh, it should be greater when the cost of being wrong is more. And it should be less when the cost of being rigorous, of being consistent, transparent, and uh, in independent is higher. And what this means is that for every single project, the, uh, the right rigor is going to be different. Uh, it must be different. <clears throat> and uh, this is something that I think is completely uncontroversial. It's deeply embedded in everything that we do in society. For example, uh, the standard of proof, the right rigor in the legal system, is different in different situations, both in the UK and the US. Uh, in civil court cases, there's a different standard of proof from criminal court cases. In civil cases, you have to prove that the person is more likely to have been guilty than not. In criminal court cases, you need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, or beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reason is because there's a deep legal doctrine that imprisoning a person is worse than fining a person, and the cost of being wrong is higher. Um, different standards of proof for different situations. The same is true of clinical trials in medicine uh, and uh, uh, the development of new medical treatments. Phase one trials are very small. They're observational. There's no big burden to show that the people that you're treating are just like uh, other people in the population. You're just trying to show that the medicine doesn't kill people. Uh, by the time you get to phase three, 
thousands of people are involved. You're just about to unleash the treatment on the larger populace. Uh, and most phase three trials for that reason are randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind. Different standards of proof, different right rigor for different situations. I think exactly is the same is the true of all uh, development projects that we might want to, uh, to evaluate. And how do you choose the right level of rigor? Well, uh, to me, important dimensions of rigor, important dimensions of things that persuade me that a project is, uh, has the impact that it, uh, that it is claimed to have are the independence of the people making the assessment. It can be people, uh, this can range from, from strictly internal to the project to uh, uh, neutral, disinterested third parties. Um, how uh, flexible the goals are. For some very exploratory projects, it's important that the goals be allowed to shift over time as we learn about how the project is working. Uh, but it's, it's uh, much more uh, uh, clearly persuasive and transparent when, a, when the goal posts are not constantly shifting throughout the project. And finally, uh, I, what I think is very important is, is the transparency of establishing what would have happened without the project. And in some cases, this, this must and should be completely hypothetical. If we want to evaluate the effect of national defense on British people, we can never observe any British people who are not subject to national defense, and we shouldn't. That is the right level of rigor in that dimension for that evaluation. In other evaluations where the treatment is much more geographically specific or individually specific, it's much, uh, it, it, it can be made much, uh, much clearer uh, 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 what would have happened to the, the people treated had they not been treated. Um, I say all of this just to make my first point, which is that uh, uh, right rigor absolutely is not the same thing as randomization. Um, I, I, uh, I have used randomization in uh, two of my papers. I support its increased usage in evaluation, uh, like many uh, brilliant uh, British uh, public intellectuals like Tim Harford and Ben Goldacre and many others. Um, but I also w would agree with uh, Michael Kramer, one of the leading advocates of, of randomization and one of the most brilliant economists in the world who understands very well what it can and can't do. When he said on US Capitol Hill a few months ago, I heard him say uh, about one in 1,000 development projects should get a randomized controlled trial. I think that's roughly the right, uh, the, the right uh, fraction. The right rigor across the entire spectrum of rigor for different projects should be different and there should be a, there should be a, a, broad, a, a broad case appropriate range. Uh, what we need to do is find the right point in the spectrum. So uh, when we don't, what can go wrong? That's how I want to approach this question of how to find the right place. Uh, when, the, when we can do more to, uh, to avoid the cost of being wrong, at a very low cost, um, without expending a lot of effort, without sacrificing a lot of scarce resources, we should move to the right on the, this uh, spectrum of rigor. And I want to talk about a case where I think the, the, the point was placed way, way too far to the left. Um, and that's the, the Millennium Villages project. I, I, I don't think I need to tell most people here that the Millennium Villages project is a, uh, a multi-sector uh, village level package intervention it, uh, the project began in the middle of 2004. Uh, it's uh, going on across Africa. This is a map of uh, 14 of its principal intervention sites. It uh, up applies a, 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 a package that differs by site in, the, in five areas, uh, agriculture, uh, education, health, water sanitation, and infrastructure, all at the same time. And it is a, a joint project of Columbia University and the United Nations. Very high profile project. Uh, it is the uh, principal policy initiative to emerge from the Millennium Summit of 2000, uh, which happens to have been the largest gathering of heads of state of all time for any reason. Very high profile, very in, uh, influential uh, uh, project. And the, the, the question is, what has been the impact of this project? So um, from, uh, from early on, this is an article in, in 2007, three years into the project, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The, uh, the leaders of the project wrote that uh, we are not going to have any uh, comparison or control uh, villages. We're going to do our impact evaluation by before and after analysis. And we're going to complement that by uh, uh, collecting district level indicators. 
presumably to compare what is going on in the uh, village sites with what's going on in, in the districts. Now, there was, uh, there was some early skepticism about this. Uh, there's a, a 2008 book called Economic Gangsters by uh, uh, Ted Miguel, one of the uh, leading uh, impact evaluators in the world uh, at UC Berkeley, and Ray Fisman, who uh, happens to be at Columbia University in the business school. There was another article by Ed Carr in 2008 at uh, University of South Carolina. And they expressed some of these concerns that I've talked about, about the, these dimensions of rigor. Concerns that the, uh, the evaluation was going on strictly internally. Uh, everybody who's involved in the evaluation was uh, associated with the project in one way or another. Um, there were concerns about, the, uh, about moving goalposts. And I, I just want to illustrate for you some of the, the, the flexibility in the goal, the stated goal of the project through time. Uh, the project describes it, described uh, itself as a, a solution to extreme poverty. Uh, it said that it could meet the Millennium Development Goals, which is something different. Um, it said that it could achieve self-sustaining economic growth in the villages, which is something else also. Uh, it said that it could do this in five years' time, which is a, a really remarkable claim. Um, it said that uh, it would break villages free from a poverty trap, that is, have lasting effects which is, uh, again, a, a different claim from all of the above, um, that, uh, that one of its uh, principal goals was reducing child mortality. Um, and uh, it, in, in some documents, it, it, it even said, actually, it's none of the above. Uh, the elements of this package are already known to have these effects. What we're doing is just designing and documenting effective delivery systems for already proven interventions. All of these different dimensions and uh, of a uh, failure in one could be uh, uh, circumvented by describing success in another one. Slippery uh, situation. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but we were interested to see what the evaluation results would be, and they came in the middle of 2010. Uh, this is when the project st first started making uh, official statements about its impact. So here, uh, from a, a report car har called Harvests of Development, uh, the uh, the, the project is claiming one of its impacts at Bansaso, Ghana, was to increase the, in, the uh, uh, <coughs> hello. <laughs> uh, it, 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 is it okay? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> that one of its impacts at Bansaso, Ghana, was to increase the uh, ownership of cell phones, uh, another one to, uh, to double access to clean water. And my co-author, Gabriel de Mombin, who's at the Nairobi office of the World Bank, uh, saw this. He was living in Nairobi. Uh, he was seeing a similar claim of impact uh, at the, the Saori Kenya site that the, the, the project had caused cell phone ownership to rise. And he, he, he emailed me and said, you know, that's, that's one of the oddest statements I've ever heard. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, cell phone ownership would have risen substantially at Saori if this project had never arrived. And uh, we did a comparison of, of many of the uh, the trends at the villages uh, uh, to surrounding areas. So here, uh, just for Bonsaso, Ghana, you're seeing in white the trend in cell phone ownership at, uh, at, the, at the Millennium Village site. And in blue, this is the, uh, the, uh, the same statistic uh, in the rural areas of the surrounding Ashanti region, of, of which Bonsaso is a tiny fraction, really changing at the same rate. Uh, more typical among the many indicators we studied was that the, 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 the uh, uh, more or less, the changes at the village sites uh, were, were progressing faster than the surrounding areas, but that something like half of the changes that they were seeing at the village sites were part of uh, broader trends. But they were progressing faster at the village sites. Um, now, one way to react to this, and th this is what Shanta Devarajan, the chief economist of, of, uh, for Africa at the World Bank, suggested publicly, uh, would be to uh, take this on and do the analysis that they originally said they were going to do in 2007, which is compare changes at the sites to changes in, in the districts. Uh, what they did instead was, uh, uh, I, I don't know any other way to describe it, is to spend a year trying to discredit every word that we had said, r rather than uh, say that even in one sentence that anything that we had said was, uh, was correct. Um, typical of that discussion is this, uh, statement in a late 2011, this is a year after we wrote our paper, after many backs and f many public back and forth uh, uh, blog posts and articles. Um, uh, Prabhupada Singh and Jeffrey Sachs were writing that, uh, trying to, to uh, negate the conceptual validity 
of comparing trends at the sites to trends outside the sites because life is changing everywhere, inside the Millennium Villages and outside of them. Uh, when David McKenzie at the World Bank, who's one of the leading experts on uh, uh, impact evaluation in the world, read this, he described it as just a baffling comment. How could anybody <laughs> say that? The reason you need to, com the, the very reason that you need to, that you must compare trends at the sites to trends elsewhere is, is this, <laughs> is the fact that things are changing uh, everywhere. Um, later this, uh, you won't find this blog post online because it later was quietly uh, deleted and scrubbed. It, it doesn't uh, exist anymore. Um, uh, so so that this was the level of discussion, which is really unfortunate. What's clear is that their statements about impact didn't change, I mean, at all. So this is a report issued a year after our paper where they are still doing before and after analysis. Here's, uh, this is for skilled health uh, personnel. Um, they changed from the word impact to the words uh, uh, result and achievement, which I think is a, is a pretty pointless word game. Uh, there's a reason why I can't say, I took an umbrella to work today, and as a result, it rained. And the reason I can't say that is because the word result is a statement of cause and effect, just like the word achievement. I would never say, uh, my achievement is that things happened here that had nothing to do with my activity. Of course, achievement is the same thing as impact. Uh, and it was really unfortunate that they kept making these, uh, these exact same statements. Um, now, uh, uh, all through that discussion, we were told repeatedly, wait for the peer-reviewed scientific evidence. It's coming in the journals. It's just not here yet. These are popular publications. Um, I'm of the opinion that statements in popular publications should also be true. Uh, especially when they're stamped with the name of Columbia University, a, an institution I revere. Bec my dad used to be a professor there, and so did my aunt. Um, but, uh, but we did. We waited for the, the uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications, and this was one of the first of them. Uh, in late uh, 2011, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, they, they finally did compare trends at the sites to trends off the sites. They documented uh, a decline in uh, child malnutrition, as measured by stunting, at the sites, and they compared it to the national trend. But they did it in such a bizarre way. This is the national trend that they measure. Back to 1986, that's where that black line is coming from. And th these are the years that the project is going on. So this is absolutely bizarre. And we wrote, a, Gabriel and I wrote a letter of protest to the, the editors of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition saying, there's almost no information about what was going on during the project. The only reason to go back to 1986 is that it makes the project look good because child mal malnutrition was not changing over that very long and completely irrelevant period. Uh, in the next issue of AJCN, the, the authors were forced to admit that, in fact, there, there were data available during the time of the project and that uh, child malnutrition was substantially declining. It was declining faster at the Millennium Village sites. There's, there's no reason not to report it, but for some reason they hadn't reported it. Um, now, after all of that, two years of that, you might wonder, why did I spend two years on this? And that would be a great question. <laughs> uh, after two years of that back and forth about comparing national trends to, site, to trends at the village sites, it got even worse than all of this. On May 8th, they issued this article in The Lancet claiming uh, not just that there had been a huge decrease in child mortality at the sites, but that that decrease was three times faster than the decrease that had happened at the national level, 7.8% per year versus 2.6% per year. Now, this has the advantage of being impressive it has the disadvantage of being false. Uh, this number, 7.8%, I, I, I discovered when I first read the paper was due to an unfortunate error of arithmetic. The true change, as measured by their own numbers year on year, was 5.9% percent, 5 percent, uh, percent decline. Uh, it was overstated by a third. And uh, this number, uh, uh, documented by, in data collected by Gabriel Demombin, my co-author, who's an expert in, in uh, child mortality in Africa, uh, was wildly off. Uh, in these countries, during the relevant period, during the time of the project, this was, uh, child mortality was declining at 6.4% per year across all of the countries in question. Uh, as we were talking about before the seminar, one of the most amazing facts in all of development, and, and uh, something that deserves celebration, something that deserves better understanding, but certainly something that deserves uh, accurate uh, reporting. Those are the same number. 
it turned out that, that the decline in child mortality at these sites was exactly tracking national trends in these countries. Um, that's where it got really uh, ugly. Uh, Nature, one of the leading scientific journals of the world, uh, had a sharply worded uh, lead editorial uh, entitled With Transparency Comes Trust. And uh, 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 together with Lawrence Haddad of the Institute for Development Studies and two other colleagues, we wrote a protest letter to the Lancet editor. That letter was accepted on May 16th. Uh, on May 18th, uh, they, uh, they retracted this principal finding of their main research project pr product. Uh, and, uh, and shortly thereafter, the, uh, uh, suddenly, the, the head of monitoring and evaluation was no longer employed at the project. Um, now, uh, all of this is, uh, is an incredibly sad story. I think it serves to illustrate uh, uh, the, the problems that arrive when there's opacity about what would have happened without the, the, the project. But I, I want to mention one other thing, just because uh, s some of these things are often talked about, and this, this aspect of impact evaluation is not often talked about, and it's that to do an impact evaluation, you have to consider not just uh, the, how the outcome would have changed uh, without, the, uh, without the intervention, but how the world would have changed without the intervention, and that includes what else that money would have been spent on? What was the opportunity cost of spending that money on this project? And this project is spending a lot of money, so it's important to do that analysis, to make that transparent as well. We, we only know the full all-in, on-site and off-site, everything included cost of this project at one site, uh, because DFID, to its great credit, uh, which is funding part of a new site in Upper East Ghana, has, has released that full cost information. It's the only time that's been done for a Millennium Village site. And that new site in Upper East Ghana, which starts uh, this month, uh, uh, is projected to cost 17 million pounds. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, it plans to affect, in one way or another, 6,000 households, which means that the expenditure per household that is affected uh, in any way uh, is uh, 2,800 pounds per household that is affected in any way. That's 13 times the annual income of the households in question. Uh, uh, a, a different way to view the same expenditure is to ask how, many, how much they're spending per household that will be lifted out of poverty, not just uh, uh, how many, uh, per household affected in any way. And that's a lot more. That's 34 times uh, uh, income. Why is this important? It's important because uh, uh, the project has re recently said, commenting on Gabriel Demombin's data about the decline in child mortality across Africa, that a big part of that, perhaps most of it, has been caused by anti-malaria efforts, including insecticide-treated bed net distribution. Um, with this amount of money, hundreds of households could have been covered with insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, not just one. So if that's a big part of the uh, decline in child mortality, if indeed there has been a decline in child mortality caused at the sites, which uh, we're still waiting for good evidence on, and the Lancet article certainly wasn't that, but it might, if it has been causing that decline in child mortality, uh, it's worth asking, uh, for this same expenditure in a different way, could we have saved more children? And if we don't even ask, I think we're being irresponsible, because there are ethical uh, complexities uh, here. Uh, so, um, I've, uh, I've talked about why I, I, I think this, uh, this, uh, this project has been, uh, I think, too far to the left, further left than it should have been on this spectrum of, of rigor, too much internal, uh, too flexible with its goals, and uh, too, uh, too, too opaque in documenting whether or not uh, the differences that we're, that we're looking at are truly uh, effects. Um, it's an incredibly sad story. There's no possible winner imaginable here. No African will be helped because the credibility of this project, in my opinion, has been irreparably damaged. No African will be helped by the forcing out of any staff members. There's no nice part of this. But I want to close on a positive note because I think there is a positive lesson to be taken here. Uh, and it's what can go right when you do rigorous impact evaluation and choose a good point on this spectrum of rigor, one that uh, is uh, cost-effectively uh, convincing. Uh, the best example of that that I know of is this uh, program, Progresa, that I think a lot of you might know, 
uh, begun by the Mexican government in 1997. It's an acronym. It uh, stands for El Programa de uh, Educación, Salud y Alimentación, the uh, uh, Education, Health, and Nutrition Program. Uh, it continues today under a different name, Oportunidades. And it was a, uh, a multi-sector uh, intervention, cash transfer plus uh, uh, health and nutrition interventions, conditional on school enrollment. That, for highly idiosyncratic reasons, ended up being evaluated very well. Uh, it was mainly due to the influence of a few wise individuals. Santiago Levy, who was in the Mexican government at the time, Miguel Sekeli, who was in the Mexican government at the time, Paul Gertler of Berkeley and uh, others. Um, they made sure that this, this evaluation was done uh, independently with consistent goals and very convincingly, very transparently. And it was hugely influential as an advocacy tool to strengthen this intervention and its spread. It influenced imitators. Uh, it is first went all over America. Honduras got PRAF. Colombia got famili Familias en Acción, uh, Brazil got Bolsa Familia. Uh, it, it took over the hemisphere and from there has taken over the world. And a big part of that was because there was this clear, transparent, independent evaluation to show what the impacts really were. Um, it helped defend the project from political change. As I mentioned, it, it started in 1997. When the government changed in 2002, they decided to keep it rather than killing the program. And a big part of that, according to the insiders, was this evaluation. Um, they used the results of the impact evaluation to make it better, to modify it during the huge scale up within Mexico. And it helped uh, Miguel Sekeli asserts, attract funding away from other anti-poverty programs within the government and toward this one. What I want to point out is that this, this uh, impact evaluation was not a threat to the program. It was not a threat to uh, to the agencies that were uh, implementing it. The, it was not a threat to their budget. It was a tool for effective advocacy and scale up. And that's what impact evaluation can be when it's done well. Um, this is what I want to leave you with, my, my, my three points, that right rigor is absolutely not the same thing as randomization uh, as a rule. Uh, it is not optional if we're going to speak of impacts. It's fine not to talk about impacts, but if you're going to talk about impacts, you have to think about what think seriously in one way or another, qualitative, quantitative, but transparent and independent and consistent about what would have happened without the project. And that it can be not a threat, but an opportunity for ethical and effective aid advocacy. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Pretty sure you kept your promise of 30 minutes to. I well hope so. Michael. Now, before I pass over uh, uh, to Bele, who's sitting there patiently in uh, in Addis, I think um, I, I was very remiss in my introductions, and before Richard Dowden shoots me from afar at the end of the uh, virtual line, there I, I do want to say that we are co-hosting this event with the Royal African Society, and it was actually Richard Dowden's idea to to bring Michael over to, to, to talk to us about this. So apologies for not saying that at the outset. OK, um, there's a very strong proposition on, on the table that, that uh, comes out of, of Michael's presentation about the need to, to really uh, you know, crack this issue of how we evaluate impact in a way that is credible, uh, in a way that, that, that really does uh, yeah, meet the crucial test, and I think your tests, three tests on rigor are just terrifically helpful around independence, around consistency, and around transparency. And I think those are, are watchwords for us all when we're thinking about evaluating um, impact of any kind. 